Welcome to the Invernadero Mind Podcast. I am your host, Gabriela, and I'm so happy that you're here. Invernadero is the Spanish for a greenhouse. It represents light, life, and a home for bright minds. In this podcast, I discuss hot present topics in today's culture, and our guests share their successes, challenges, and their journey in finding balance between chasing their dreams while protecting their mind and spirit in this fast-paced culture. In this inclusive podcast, we talk to everyone. Stay tuned and let's get the conversation started. Our next guest is on her way to becoming an amazing vet and advocate for animals and social equality. She tells us how her passion for animals led her to pursue a career as a veterinarian and also shares her struggles in getting admitted to Cornell. We discuss her struggles and experiences on being Hispanic and a woman in this industry. She also talks about One Health, which is a project she is working on that I think everyone should learn about. Let's welcome Maria Camila Garcia. Hello, Maria Camila. Thank you so much for doing this interview. Hey, Gabby. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. <laughs> Bienvenida. I'm especially excited because you speak also Spanish and I feel yes. like <laughs> we can connect, uh, you know, at a deeper level. Um, you know, when I was looking at your Instagram account, I became immediately interested for a, a few reasons. One of them being that you are, first of all, you're a Latina and you work with animals, which I, you know, I, I love animals. And, but, uh, you know, additionally, I also, something that caught my attention is your, your work, the, the message that you're spreading and the content that you are sharing with your audience, which we will get to in a minute, but let's start from the beginning. How did you decide you wanted to, you know, become a veterinary or, you know, go to vet school? So I've always known I was going to be a veterinarian since about maybe like six years old. I was, I would draw animals all the time. I'd always just be saying that I want to be a vet. I want to be a vet. How, however, that has progressed, like what type of vet I want to, I wanted to be has changed over time. Initially, I wanted to be an equine vet. So a horse vet. Mm -hmm. And eventually I kind of, you know, I started taking more classes about the environment, about uh, conservation. And I realized, you know, we have, you know, we're in the middle of the sixth mass extinction event. You know, we are, have so many species in the world that are endangered or critically endangered. And for some reason that just really touched me. And I, I realized like, that's what I want to do. I want to be a veterinarian that treats wildlife, that helps injured wildlife have a second chance at survival. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of started that way. And then uh, it was like that in college for several years. And even that has now evolved a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So originally I was, okay, I'm going to be a wildlife vet. I'm going to work as a, either in a zoo or in a sanctuary or something. And then I took a course called um, Conservation with Communities for One Health. And in this course, I learned and I realized that conservation is so much more than just animals, than just the wildlife. Mm -hmm. It's really about people and the people that interact with this wildlife in, you know, mostly in developing countries. There seems to be a lot of friction between the needs of people and the needs of animals. So we have things like, you know, habitat destruction and poaching and all of these things, but it's, people are so quick to judge you know, like poachers or other people and say, oh, these are horrible people, but they don't realize that a lot of people, it's not that they hate wildlife and don't want them to be around. It's just that sometimes necessity, you know, they're in so much poverty that necessity requires that they also do some of these things to provide mm -hmm. food for their families, to send their kids to school, all of these things. So I kind of had like an epiphany mm -hmm. moment <laughs> and I was like, oh my God. I also care very much about people and I'm very passionate about social justice and all these other things. And I, I never realized that I could somehow combine both of these passions, my passion for veterinary medicine and my yeah. passion for people and helping people. 
And so I decided to do uh, an MPH, so a master's in public health. Mm. And I started learning about this thing called One Health, which I don't know if you have questions about that. If you do, I can answer those later. Yes. Um, but it, eventually I realized uh, I don't want to be just a wildlife veterinarian. I want to be a veterinarian that also works with people. And in order to do that, I need to learn a little bit more about, um, you know, people's main source of income, which in a lot of countries is livestock. So I've always kind of shied away from working with farm animals just because I used to have a different view of life. I am vegetarian mm -hmm. <laughs> for many of these reasons, but I have realized that in a lot of the world, people depend on these animals for their living. And if we can provide, you know, better health for their animals and improve their local economies, they might be more uh, compliant with uh, conservation initiatives and helping them find alternative sources of income by right. improving their own livestock. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the idea right now. Um, I've been considering a PhD in the future, although I don't know, that's a lot of school, yeah. but we'll see. <laughs> so yeah, I would essentially to cut it short, um, I want to be a veterinarian that also works with people. So working at human wildlife interface, helping to resolve human wildlife conflict between mm -hmm. wildlife and people. So helping people improve their livelihoods and also advocate for conservation. That's awesome. And I'm glad you mentioned that. I would definitely, we will get that to that in a, in a few minutes. But, but going back to you a little bit, you know, you go to Cornell. How did you choose your university? So Cornell has always kind of had a special place in my heart since I would say date, going back to high school, like freshman year of high school. I actually had a professor, my, an English professor who had us do an assignment where we had to pick a school, uh, a university and do research on it based mm -hmm. on if we could see ourselves going there. And at the time, I always knew I wanted to be a vet. So I was like, I'm just going to look up what's the number one vet school in the country. And at that time, it was Cornell. Um, now we've fallen to number two, but it's still one of the top universities for veterinarians. Um, and so I, I picked Cornell for the research paper. I had to research everything about it, like all the programs they have, all of the um, student activities that are available, all the different opportunities. Uh, I had to look at pictures of the campus and I just absolutely fell in love. I fell in love. <laughs> and um, So yeah, so I applied my senior year and I got rejected. <laughs> oh, wow. It, it was so crushing. I was, <laughs> oh my God, it was so bad. Um, but there was like a little light at the end of the tunnel. They were, Cornell was like, we don't have room in our freshman class this year, but we want to offer you a special transfer option where if you go to another institution mm -hmm. um, and complete your first year and you get good grades, you can automatically transfer. Just like send in your transcript and you can come to Cornell. And I was oh, like, that's cool. I mean, oh. you know, it's not the first option, but yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah it was still like a possibility for me. So mm -hmm. I actually did my first year of college at University of Florida mm -hmm. and I ended up really, really liking UF. So it actually was hard, a lot harder than I thought it was going to be to leave because, you know, Cornell had always been my dream, but yeah. in the end, um, I still opted for Cornell. Um, they did provide like significantly much better financial aid package. And so I went and I have been there ever since. And then I graduated Cornell undergrad. And again, you know, Cornell vet school was always the goal. And so I wanted to go to undergrad so that I could be, you know, near the vet school and kind of like yeah. finagle my way in there. <laughs> and I did that. I got to know faculty at the vet school. I worked at the vet school in like different labs, mm -hmm. you know, trying to increase my network of people that I knew at that vet school. And eventually <laughs> mm -hmm. I, um, I got in uh, as a vet student. Um, it took me a while though. I, I did apply the first time and I didn't get in. Yeah. And again, another soul crushing <laughs> event. <laughs> but um, that didn't stop me. I always saw myself there and I actually ended up going for my MPH. Mm -hmm. So, I, and then after the MPH, well, I'm still, I haven't finished the MPH yet, but um, after one year of the MPH, I reapplied and got in. 
So now I guess you could say I'm a triple Cornelian. <laughs> That's super cool. The Cornell passion is strong. Yeah. <laughs> My <laughs> Cornell. I can see that. That's super cool. I like that you that uh, sweater. Now, uh, talking about loans and scholarships, how accessible was it to you? I mean, um, what are the requirements to access, you know, either, you know, scholarships or loans or how was it for you? So the beauty of going to a really, I guess, like, so Cornell is a partly a land grant institution. So it means it's, it's partly private and partly public. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, this allows for more like uh, they have more a bigger endowment. So like more opportunities to provide scholarships for students. Um, because my family made a certain income that was below a certain range. I can't remember the exact range. I was given a really, really nice financial aid package and mm-hmm. for undergrad, this is for undergrad. Um, and it ended up covering like about 80% of mm. my education because, you know, Cornell is really expensive. It's like yeah. $60,000 a year, like yeah. never in a million years could my family afford that. So, um, thankfully financial aid was really amazing. Um, I did have to get some loans obviously. Yeah. Um, and you know, you can apply to scholarships and stuff, but those are hard to get. So I mostly yeah. rely on loans. When I graduated undergrad, I, um, I didn't have that much debt. Um, and now though, is a, t- <laughs> a different story because grad school is, um, they don't give you as much aid in terms of like grants. It's mostly like loans, but even those loans are, you know, they have a lower interest rate, they're federal student loans and, mm-hmm. Unfortunately, for most veterinary professionals and veterinary students, that's just a part of life. Um, a lot of people graduate with a lot of debt, but there are many different um, loan repayment programs and even some loan forgiveness programs, depending on if you do things like public service, like for example, you work for the government or you work for a nonprofit. Um, and actually Cornell is considered a nonprofit as, a, as an institution. Um, so, yeah, there's, that is something that does worry me, like the money, <laughs> obviously, but, um, you know, I always tell people, like, don't let that be an obstacle for you. Like, my mom always says, where there's a will, there's a way. And I know, like, it seems really daunting, because it is a lot of money, and it's a huge investment. But if you think about it, you're making an investment in yourself, and in your career, and in your future. Yeah. If you're passionate about what you do, like, the success is going to come and you're going to be able to overcome that. But Mm -hmm. unfortunately it is a big, a big part of life, unfortunately. And veterinarians don't really make as much as uh, medical doctors do, but we do graduate with like a similar amount of debt, which is, you know, it's quite unfortunate, but. Were you working on the side? How are you juggling, you know, between, you know, your career, your passion and your finances? Yeah, that's, uh, that's another good point. I did have um, federal work study as mm-hmm. a student. So what that means is um, the federal government provides half of your salary, and then the other half of your salary is provided by your employer. So this is really appealing to a lot of employers on campus because they don't have to, you still get paid what you're supposed to get paid, but they don't have to provide as much of that money like on their part because the government provides the other part. So I did have a ton of different jobs <laughs> throughout my time in undergrad. <laughs> I worked a lot in different labs. Um, I did a lot of little like side projects. I TA'd different courses mm-hmm. that would then pay me. Um, what else did I do? <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I did a lot of just like little side jobs here and there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so you said you are you're going right now for your MPH. Uh, I read that you're a candidate. What does it mean to be a candidate? So you say in your like my profile says DVM MPH candidate. Um, that's because like I haven't completed the DVM or the MPH. So for now, I'm like on track to receive both of those degrees. Um, hopefully by 2023, I will be a DVM MPH. I might finish it this summer. I don't, not sure yet. Um, so for now I just put, you know, candidate instead of saying like student, it's just like, okay, 
fancier term for like student. You're like, oh, a candidate. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds cool though. It sounds very、um, technical. So you. Yeah,、um, yeah. <laughs> While researching your your bio, I read that you're also co-president of Cornell's first ever Latin Veterinary Medical Association. How do you get involved in that? Yeah, so the Latinx Veterinary Medical Association.、Um, it was actually co- like co-founded by two good friends of mine,、um, Yvette Wizar and Juancho Orjuela. They're both veterinary students.、Um, Juancho goes to vet school in Canada in Ontario, and Yvette goes to vet school with me. She's actually a current fourth year, so she will be graduating in May.、Mm-hmm. And so、um, there's you know there's not a lot of Latinos in general. In the veterinary field, unfortunately, we are highly underrepresented. There's only about, in all the veterinarians in the U.S., there's only about of all veterinarians, there's five percent of them are Latinx. Oh wow, that's、um, a small even、amount. less. Yeah, even less for like black、yeah. um, veterinarians. It's like two percent of all veterinarians are black. It's crazy. So、um, Yvette,、uh, she's really great. She's always she had always wanted to kind of find if there was like. An organization that you know she could connect with mentors and that you know looked like her, had similar experiences like her, and the same with Juancho. And so there wasn't one,、mm-hmm. and so they decided to create it. And so they created the national organization.、Uh, it's now like a nonprofit, and they want to have different chapters in all the different vet schools in North America. So, the very first chapter, obviously, it was going to be at Cornell,、mm-hmm. and so because she was, her and Juancho were kind of busy doing like all the stuff for the national org, they didn't really have、uh, time to like have the local, you know, the local chapter. So Yvette asked me、um, if I would be the the president, the co-president,、uh, for the first chapter ever, and so. Yeah, so I said yes, of course.、Um, I'm very passionate about that too. Like, I do want to see more representation of Latinx veterinarians in veterinary medicine. We are、mm-hmm. highly, highly underrepresented, and I think it's really important because a lot of pet owners in the U.S. are、um, either bilingual or only speak Spanish, and so there's a gap there in health that、right. we can bring for animals, right? So. So yeah, so I felt passionate about it, and I decided to kind of step into that role. And I have my lovely co-president, my good friend, Asia Faranda.、Um, so her and I run the club together, and we have other, obviously, like the executive board and all of that. And、uh, and now, like, that organization has grown. So now there's like all these other chapters popping up. Oh wow! All over. So we have chapters in at UPenn. We have a chapter in North Carolina, at Ross University in Michigan.、Um, where else? Like just everywhere. All these other chapters are popping up, and it's just so exciting and cool to see that.、Um, yeah, and it, really- it has to be exciting, <laughs> especially when you feel underrepresented. It's something that it feels like a movement in a way, right? Because、yeah. you definitely want more representation. You want more. Um, Latinos getting involved in this career. Now, you also host、uh, workshops to teach, you know, about the Latinx culture and the language. Have people been open and willing to participate to learn? Did you see any、yeah. resistance to it? No, not at all. Actually, a ton of. St- so,、uh, one of the first things we did as a club. So, because of COVID, we founded this organization. Was founded.、Uh, okay, let me backtrack. The First chapter of LVMA, the Cornell chapter, was actually kind of founded before the national one was like fully established. So,、um, and it was this was back in like February of this year, so it's super new.、Um, and then you know COVID hit. Yeah. So we've only really been operating like fully online. <laughs> oh wow. So when summer came, you know, a lot of students had their whole like schedules completely changed, like. You know, all of a sudden we we didn't know what to do with our time. And normally students go on, you know,、uh, internships or they have jobs or they travel or something.、Um, and that was my case too. I was supposed to do something else that summer, but just everything got thrown off. So then I said, okay, what can I do?、Um, and you know, we just started this club. We haven't even gotten to do any events or anything.、Um, why don't we like just do something for the summer? So in May, I saw this like 
podcast or something about it was about veterinarians and they were it was like Yvette and Juancho were on this podcast which is why I tuned in our mm -hmm. founders and there was another woman there and she was from Colorado and she talked about this like Span medical Spanish course for, for veterinarians that they have at Colorado State uh, University and yeah. I was like what like amazing <laughs> that they have a medical Spanish yeah. veterinary course and I'm like what the heck why doesn't yeah. Cornell have this like we're supposed to be number two in the country and like yet we don't even have a Spanish course and <laughs> you know that just to me was like unreal um yeah. so I contacted this woman and I asked her about the course and I just got really inspired and I'm like you know what our first thing should be to host like medical Spanish workshops mm -hmm. and so and I I actually called them Spanish communication workshops. I don't say medical Spanish because I, there's so much more than that. I don't want to just teach people how to say medical terms in Spanish because mm -hmm. anybody can like look that up. I also wanted to teach them about the culture, about Latinx culture, about how to interact with different clients depending on where they're from because, you know, a Latino community has different beliefs towards their relationship with animals mm -hmm. than mainstream U.S. culture. And so that's really important to know, especially for that, you know, client communication and like being able to uh, reach your clients in a way that they understand. And so I decided to call it Spanish communication. So I, in every um, workshop that we did, we would, yeah, talk about vocabulary and like teach students, okay, this is how you take a basic history mm -hmm. in Spanish. But also, we want we gave them instruction about like the cultural context. So for example, um, neutering a dog. Yeah. How are you gonna talk to a Latino client who, you know, normally there's a lot of resistance about yes. especially neutering animals? You know, there's different beliefs like, oh no, like you're gonna take away his manhood or you know, that type oh, of thing. Oh my god, yes. So yes, yes, how yes. Do you, yeah, how do you approach that in a culturally sensitive way, given this, you know, the, the cultural norms of many Latinx countries. And so, yeah, so we focused a lot of, on the cultural aspect as well, uh, or things like food, you know, like in a lot of Latinx countries, people just give their dogs or their animals like food scraps, like whatever you ate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. is so different, you know, you go and buy like kibble. Mm -hmm. Like someone has been giving their dog food scraps their entire life, like who are we to tell them like, Oh, no, you, you can't do that anymore. It can only be kibble. So like, you know, you have to like meet people where they're at and like work with them. And so yeah, so we started doing that. And um, they were so super successful. We had a really good turnout of students that came every week. We did it for about, I want to say like eight weeks or so. Yeah. In the summer and we mostly focused it on small animal medicine. So like mm -hmm. cats and dogs. But I do want to bring it back and do another series on like large animal, like dairy, especially dairy, because um, the majority of people who work on dairy farms are actually um, undocumented Latinx people from like Guatemala, Mexico, and like a lot of them don't speak English. Mm -hmm. So I think it's super important for the veterinarians to be able to communicate with these workers because we rely on them for information on the animals, on the history of the animal, how they're doing. Also treatments, like if the veterinarian can't go for any reason, then, you know, we have to train the farm workers on how to like take care of the animals, how to, um, how the like farm workers can see the signs of illness in an animal. But how do you explain that if they don't speak English and you don't speak Spanish? True. So, yeah, I felt it was, important to do that so I'm working on that and hopefully my next project um, that's for my MPH I'm trying to do like a curriculum for like a real course not just through like a club mm -hmm. but make like a real course in the vet school but we'll see we'll see how that goes <laughs> awesome now what kind of skills do you need to be in your field I mean because you obviously have to know how to interact with the with the clients but also you have to be um you have to be, you know, a doctor, right? You still have to think like, you know, um, I guess 
scientifically when you're trying to, you know, for example, um, cure an animal or come up with solutions to a problem? What kind of skills do you need? What are what would be the top three skills that you need to develop? I would say having emotional intelligence or like, you know, communication skills are actually really, really important. Um, just because, you know, like somebody can study and like all day and know every single thing about anatomy and whatever, but like, if you can't connect to a client and like mm -hmm. get to know them as a person and, you know, cause you want to, you want them to feel included in the health of their animal, right? Like you guys are a team mm -hmm. and the animal is only going to get better if both of you work together. So communication skills are super important. Um, obviously you wanna be able to like have experiences in the veterinary field. So in undergrad, um, a lot of students opt for working at an animal clinic or working, getting some hands-on experience with animals. Mm -hmm. If you think you wanna go into the veterinary field is hugely, hugely important just so that you know what you're getting into. Mm -hmm. You can know what are the great things about being a veterinarian and what are some of the not so great things about being a veterinarian. For example, um, euthanasia. That's something that is so uh, like, you know, emotionally draining for veterinarians. And yet some people have to do that every day. Like I've spoken to veterinarians that they're like, this is my 10th euthanasia of the day. Like I am emotionally burnt out. Like wow. compassion fatigue is a big thing. So if you think that, you know, oh, all that veterinarians do is play with puppies and kittens all day. Like, mm -hmm. no, <laughs> that is mm -hmm. not a good reason to want to be in this career. So by getting these experiences, you know, working with veterinarians or like volunteering at a zoo or things like that, you're able to kind of get a, a better picture of what the career is. So mm -hmm. definitely doing that. Um, another skill, let's see, perseverance and like tenacity, I would say are really important for any career really, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, I know I've had my share of struggles. Like I've had people tell me that, you know, when I failed like a chemistry exam or I was failing a chemistry class, I had a professor tell me like, oh, you might want to reconsider veterinary school because I don't think you have the grades to get in. No like, way. He yeah, said like, that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what did you so, say? I, I was like in shock. I just like went home and like cried. <laughs> oh. But, you know, things like that, like really discourage people yes. like especially minorities especially if you're like in a predominantly white space and like you don't have a handle of that environment um mm -hmm. it's very easy to like internalize those negative things and and so a lot of people end up giving up on their dream because of it so what I tell people is like no if you know you have a goal in your mind and like that's what you want to do and that's what you know in your heart like you're meant to do you got to keep pushing you got to keep pushing you got to keep overcoming those obstacles um, I had to retake you know what I did was okay I was failing that class I withdrew from the class I got a W in my transcript whatever I retook the class got a way better grade and that was that so you just got you know keep moving keep pushing um don't let anybody tell you what you can and can't do like just like i love proving people wrong so like tell me i can't do something so i can like show you how i can so you know but that all comes with like perseverance with grit um it's really important to have that in, in yeah. any career but yeah in veterinary medicine like a hundred percent that's super cool um you know i feel like we, we should also explore the topic of mental health because what you were saying, you know, in general, um, everything sounds cool, right? You, you, when you think of a bed, you, you're like, okay, they get to play with, with these cool animals. They get to like, you know, experience all these great things that we don't really get to as people, regular people, you know? Um, but at the same time, mental health is super important because I feel like, just preparing for what you're going to face while at work is already, you know, a stress. Like you said, you know, even going to school is, um, can be stressful, but also while at work for a vet, like euthanasia is something that, I mean, we don't get to do that. We don't do it as, you know, regular people, mm -hmm. but you as doctors, I mean, vets and, 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 you know, doctors in general, I mean, you have to deal with that. Right. So I can only imagine the impact. I mean, going home and being like, all right, today I had to, you know, practice euthanasia like 
10 times, 15 times on different animals. Like, that has to be super, super something that, you know, is draining and emotionally just devastating. Um, so for you, you, you said that you faced some roadblocks. You gave us the examples of, you know, how, for example, somebody told you that maybe you should reconsider <laughs> studying. Um, can you give us like specific examples of like a, a success you, you might, or, or success in challenging work environments that you have, might have experienced? Like, for example, um, preparing for a specific exam or, you know, working on a specific project, because we talk about failure, right? And people fail all the time. Uh, so far, when I was interviewing all these amazing guests, they all experienced that. They said, hey, I failed this class. It's not that I'm super smart or I'm a genius. I actually failed this two, three times and actually retaking this class, you know, um, taught me something different, you know, so how about you can you give us a specific examples of like you know major roadblocks that you faced and then how what did you do so people think like the hardest the hardest part of vet school is not getting into vet school it is really hard to get into vet school there's only like 30 something of them in the country so it's already really really competitive um but the hardest part is actually staying in vet school Mm -hmm. um, and so <laughs> one of my biggest failures thus far was uh, actually la around this time last year. Um, it was my first year of vet school and my first semester. And I completely like failed my anatomy course. Like I got a, like a C. And then um, I got a letter, a lovely, really nice letter not oh my god <laughs> um if you get another low grade like this or you get an f like you're you're out no like, way for one class yeah, you have to start over in august like you have to wait a whole year and start again jesus so what did you do so, so i was you know I, essentially i was put on academic probation and that was Oh my God, the worst, the worst experience um, I've had so far, like in my academic career, like um, the imposter syndrome was huge. The anxiety was huge. I, it was like, no matter how hard I tried, I just could not get the grades. And so I just felt like, you know, my self-confidence completely hit the floor. Like it was not there. I was just like thinking, oh my God, like, what am I doing here? Mm -hmm. Like, why did they accept me? I was thinking like, oh my God, they only accepted me because they wanted to fulfill a diversity quota. I'm just like a token minority. Like, mm -hmm. I don't actually deserve to be here. I'm not as smart as, as these people. Like, look at me, I have terrible grades. Like, I'm never going to be a vet. All these crazy negative things, yeah. um, which is really, really hard. Like, yeah, my mental health was like, probably the worst that it's ever been yeah. um this is that academic pressure is just so huge and I felt like I was completely alone like I didn't know of anybody else that was in my position like I thought everyone else was like freaking geniuses and they were all getting like straight A's and everything mm -hmm. um, that was like the impression I got right because like nobody talks about these things which is, which is unfortunate um so the first class again I didn't do well the second class, which was in that same semester, we have like a weird like block system at Cornell. So that second course, you know, I was so burnt out from the previous course that like the first two weeks, I didn't even, I didn't do anything. Like I was just a zombie. And so wow. I didn't really capture any material. And then I realized, oh my God, then I, the next exam hit and I'm like, oh my God, like I'm gonna fail. <laughs> oh so I don't know how, I, Gabby, I don't know how the heck I did it, but I passed that second course by one point. Oh my gosh. <laughs> one point. I got, so I went, you know, I took the final, I flew home here to Miami. Mm -hmm. I was in, like, you know, I was at home, but I was like so nervous because I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to get my grade soon. And like that grade was going to determine if I could continue to the next semester, still going to be on probation, but at least I could continue and not have to start over. Mm -hmm. So I got my grade and I needed, I think I needed like a 70, at least a 70 to pass. And I got like a 70.1. <laughs> oh my goodness. Close. 
I literally you must have been so stressed. Oh I can only my God. God. It was horrible. It was so horrible. And then, you know, during that break was so nice because I was like, okay, I need to reevaluate. I need to reassess like what went wrong, like what happened. Um, and I also, I had this really like super intimidating meeting with like, you know, the uh, administration and like my professors and they were basically asking me, oh, what happened? Like what went wrong? And mm -hmm. I couldn't, I couldn't even tell them. Like I was just trying to like hold back the tears, like not cry in front of these people. And now, you know, they, they did that meeting to help me, but it actually, I feel like it made me feel worse because yeah. Like, Get anything Sometimes up. those meetings can be super intimidating because that <laughs> happened to me. It was so scary. It was so scary. So anyway, the good thing is I had an amazing advisor. And like my advisor, she, I've known her since undergrad. Mm -hmm. And she's like the most phenomenal woman. Um, I relate so much to her. She's so lovely. And so she like would take time out of her day and like study with me and like teach me, th even though she's not even like a professor in, mm -hmm. in my like class or anything, she would go over concepts. She would tell me all these things. And, you know, when we were talking, she's like, Camila, have you ever considered like maybe you could have like some sort of learning disability mm -hmm. or something? And I was like, you know what? I have thought about that like my entire life. Like I've always felt like I just cannot concentrate to save my life like I cannot like you give me a textbook and I'll have to read the same sentence like 20 times I, I cannot focus it's so hard it's so hard and so she got me thinking I'm like oh my gosh like maybe she's right like maybe you know like I've always felt that you know even since like undergrad I it just for some reason it would take me like so much longer to like grasp a concept yeah yeah than my peers and so eventually the following semester I, um, I asked to, you know, I got evaluated and it turned out that I have ADHD. No way. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh my God. Like, what? <laughs> and so you just, found this out like while you were at college? No, I found this out last year. Last my first year of med school. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. And so, <laughs> yeah. And I felt so much relief because I'm like, oh my God. I'm, there's nothing wrong with me. I just like, I, my brain is just wired differently. Like I learn mm -hmm. differently, not in the typical way that school teaches you things. Like that's not how I learn. Yeah. And so, um, it was just so nice to finally have like that validation. And also it made me really proud of myself because it's like this entire time I had an un undiagnosed learning disability and yet Despite all of that, I still like graduated from one of the best universities in the country. Mm -hmm. I got into vet school despite like failing a couple of classes and like not getting good grades and not having the best GPA. Despite all of that, like I still did that with a learning disability without any like right. help for that disability. And so I was like, well, but like, you know, finally when I got, and normally I've been able to bounce back from these obstacles um, just because of my determination to become a vet but eventually you know I finally kind of hit a wall that I couldn't get I past it, yeah I, realized I needed extra help so um so yeah so I you know I got diagnosed I got you know put on medication I started changing my so in, in adults how ADHD manifests is through uh, executive function so basically like, I just have trouble uh, deciding like how to organize my time like or how long something is going to take me so I just have so many things to do and so many things to study but in my brain I'm just like I just freeze like I don't know right. yeah where to start <laughs> and it's so I just tell me yes yeah I just sit there wasting time and I'm like oh my god and so yeah so I've gotten like coaching on how to like structure my time how to make a schedule all of these things I got um, accommodations for exams like I also developed like anxiety like test anxiety from this whole experience and so um, they gave me extra time on exams they gave me they gave me a peer note taker so they can help me take notes during class because for me it's really hard to like type while I'm listening to the professor while he's going through the slides I'm like ah! so my notes are always terrible but so yeah, so now I have someone that like takes notes and helps me with that. And so yeah, now I'm like, you know, after that spring semester, 
I passed all of my classes. So then I was out of academic probation. And now I'm like, you know, my GPA is still terrible, <laughs> but I'm bouncing back like little by little. And, you know, and the pandemic also added like another depth to yeah. that. Like, for mm -hmm. someone with ADHD, telling them to like sit in their house and like watch their lectures there by themselves like that is horrible <laughs> that is horrible oh my gosh that is so inspiring to hear and also in a way i feel like it touches home because i went to school for um finance and i went to business school so i did finance and international business <clears throat> and international business was okay like i did all these classes that i really liked but finance you know i i like finance don't get me wrong but i feel like while i was in college i I did fail classes and I feel like, you know, I don't know if you're on TikTok, but you know, there's uh, those videos where there, there's people saying like, are we supposed to know what we're doing? Like <laughs> I felt that because, you know, I would sit and look around and hear, you know, my teacher, my professors explain something super technical, super complicated in my mind. And everybody's like, you know, really quick to catch it. You know, everybody's understanding it. And I'm like, mm -hmm. holy shit, I don't know what I'm, you know, like, I'm so dumb. like I can't get it. <laughs> I had to schedule like appointments with my professors. And one of them was super, super sweet. I have to actually like uh, reach out to her and say how she's, you know, ask how she's doing because mm -hmm. she's this uh, Korean American teacher. She's a professor and she was so sweet. I mean, I don't know if she said, you know, I'm, I'm Korean. So I know that sometimes, you know, these things are, you know, when you present it to people, not everybody understands it and understands it the same way. So let me sit down with you and I'm going to, she literally taught me like, you know, two plus two, like <laughs> apples and <laughs> And she, you know, explained, we were talking about stocks and, and futures and stuff like that. And I was like, I cannot get this. And I feel like I'm going to fail. Like if I fail this, I'm going to ruin my entire senior year. So she was like, you know, she took the time, you know, lunchtime, everything. She would meet with me and just teach me. No, no. And eventually she said that you might actually have ADD or HDHD. You know, it's like, it's, there's nothing wrong with you. And I feel like we have to explore that stigma that, you know, just having ADD or ADHD in general, like makes you dumb or you mm -hmm. unable to learn, but it's actually the, the opposite. opposite. I feel like you yeah. learn differently, you know, and mm -hmm. there is nothing wrong with that. So I feel like, you know, schools in general should, I mean, not that I don't know what they're doing in high schools, for example, but I feel like it's something that should be explored and, you mm -hmm. know, there should be more resources to help students. Yeah, exactly. And that's where like, you know, like mentorship is so important. Like you said, mm -hmm. like that teacher for you, like that made all the difference. Like for me, it was my advisor, mm -hmm. like literally took time out of her day to sit down with me, listen to me cry. <laughs> um, she was like a therapist, tutor, like Cornell mom, all in one. Yeah. yeah. So that really like was, I think, the defining moment. Um, and that was, yeah, to date, that's still like the hardest um academic experience slash mental health issue that i have faced so far in my career wow well thank <laughs> you for sharing that definitely i feel like you're definitely not the only one and i feel like if people listen to this podcast and they go through the same thing i feel like you can definitely inspire other people to continue you know and get seek guidance right because sometimes people tell you oh there must be something wrong with you but they don't ask like oh what could be happening so that you you feel this stress or anxious or yeah. overwhelmed you know and you know what it is too like in Latino culture, that's not something that is typically talked about. Like mm -hmm. nobody really talks about mental health or like, or like needing or having like a learning disability because that's something that's looked down upon so much mm -hmm. that people just don't talk about it. Or like people get insulted when you mm -hmm. say like, oh, like you might have like a disability, like you might want to see like, you know, not that yeah. that's anything wrong with that. It's just like, it could help you if you seek help, the right help and you can like thrive better. But in our, in Latino culture, like that's not something that's like really talked about very much. So that's like, you know, that adds another layer. Like I didn't have that resource of like, I didn't grow up with that really. So, you know, you have to figure this out on your own while you're like navigating grad school. And whereas you might have other peers that like, yeah, they also have ADHD, but that was probably like diagnosed since they were like little kids, mm -hmm. you know, because Maybe also, it's another thing, like, you know, it's expensive to get tested for that. It's like $1,000 for a test. Wow. It's crazy. crazy. And so I also had thought about in undergrad, of like, 
getting that test because I always kind of knew that I had ADHD. I suspected it, but I looked at the price and I was like, I can't afford this. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, then later I realized, oh, my insurance covers it. Okay, cool. <laughs> So, but nobody, nobody like tells you these things. So then how are you supposed to like know and seek help if you, first of all, you don't know if you can afford it. Second of all, you like, it's not something that's talked about. So you haven't even considered it. And then you just think that it's just something wrong with you. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think we just, in general, we need to have more of these conversations and like Definitely. break that. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Especially with students or people in majors such as medicine or, mm-hmm. you know, there's all these majors that people tend to have the misconception that if you're going to med school, you're going to, you're, you're studying this and that, you know, you're immediately a genius, you know, and there are so many ups and downs (laughs) and challenges. I mean, it's crazy. You know what? I I think that in the long run, having these sort of like obstacles and failures and challenges in the end, they make you a better professional, a better person because these things build resilience. Mm -hmm. They build grit um, and that's something that you need to be a great, not just a good veterinarian, but a great one, you know, like you can relate to other people who are going through that. You can empathize. Mm-hmm. It builds empathy. It keeps you a bit, a little bit more humble. You're not like on your high horse, like, oh my God, I'm good at everything. I know everything. Like, no, I feel like having those failures sometimes is, is good. It's a little good for, you know, keeping you grounded, keeping you, not letting you get like a big head. Like, yeah. oh my God, I'm to Cornell, I'm like so smart, blah, blah. No. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. Um, you, you could go to Cornell, you could go to Harvard, Stanford, and still, you know, have your, your, your problems. difficulties, you know, your problems and, and learning, you know, challenges and everything. Definitely. What is One Health? Okay, so One Health is this philosophy that basically says that the health of people animals and the environment are inextricably linked and it requires that there is a multidisciplinary approach to solving really complex issues such as climate change such as the COVID-19 pandemic um, many other things that affect human animal and environmental health Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's why I'm like super passionate about this and I think it and you know it's one of the reasons I have my Instagram series uh, (laughs) where I really want people to know more about this uh, philosophy and kind of like adopt it, you know, because everything is connected. Every single thing is connected. We're not, we don't exist in like silos, right? Like Mm -hmm. everything that you do here, like any action affects things down the line. And we don't always know what that is, but we clearly see that like, um, and so Yeah, and I I think it needs more collaboration between different fields. And the big issue right now, at least in conservation, is a lot of people don't necessarily like to work together. You know, they want that, that, you know, I don't know. I think it's maybe they want that recognition for themselves or like they're very like guarded about sharing their data or like their results or whatever. But it's like, just talk to each other and you can probably find a better solution together. Um, and if you don't know like a certain um, expertise in a certain field, like you can have someone you can consult with. Like that's how, you know, I feel like that's how problems have, you're able to find better solutions to problems mm-hmm. this way. And so, so yeah, so any field can contribute to conservation in one, in one way or another. Mm-hmm. Medicine, uh, ecology, uh, policy, finance, you know, economics plays a huge role. A yes. huge role in a yep. lot of these issues. Um, what else? Journalism, you know, we need to spread the word about these different issues that are happening in the world. Um, education, you know, it's just everything everything, connected. <laughs> everything is literally connected. And so that's kind of like the philosophy I have adopted. And um, in the future, I would love to be able to work with a multidisciplinary team, people mm-hmm. of different fields, different backgrounds, um, not just like in the field that they study, but also their um, life experiences, you know, like Mm -hmm. different, like diversity, diversity in every aspect of the sense, in the sense of the word, in every sense of the word. Uh, So yeah, I think that that's like the way that we have to move forward if we want to solve these uh, really difficult problems that we're going to be facing in the next 
few decades. Yes. What is one big problem that you know you see happening regarding conservation and what what is like yeah what is the biggest problem that you see happening and how come people are not like getting together to fix it like what do you see what factors in there's so many problems <laughs> i don't even know where to start <laughs> for all day i mean i guess a big one that we're seeing that we're literally living right now is the pandemic the covid-19 pandemic the emergence of novel zoonotic diseases mm -hmm. you know um this whole pandemic started because you know uh we have things like illegal wildlife trade yes and it, there's like different wet markets around asia where there's you know wildlife illegally um sold and captured for a variety of reasons either for like traditional medicine for food for many different things for like the pet trade also. Mm -hmm. But what happens when you bring a ton of animals from different parts of the world that in, in nature would never ever interact with each other and put them in a confined space where, where they are stressed, where there's poor hygiene, mm -hmm. where they are sick. So like these animals are, you know, they're stressed out. So they're constantly shedding any viruses or bacteria or any other diseases that they naturally just carry with them. Um, and, they're, and then these diseases and these pathogens are jumping from one animal to the next, to the next, and they're mutating. And then eventually they reach people. And then that's how we get, you know, these new novel diseases. And this is the current problem that we're facing right now with this, with COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and so why haven't we solved this problem yet? Well, you know, there's a lot of um, stakeholders. There's a lot of people, there's different interests at play. Um, on one hand, you have government. On one, another hand, you have like the industries themselves, the underground, like illegal um, yeah. businesses that are going on. Uh, you have just like, people's personal beliefs, you have things like religion tying in, yes. you, have, you know, personal freedoms supposedly being like ignored. Um, you have, yeah, just like a lack of belief in science. Mm -hmm. You have miscommunication, you have fake news spreading, you know, the media is playing a role as well. Like all of these things are combining to create sort of this like, perfect storm and it has ended in it has resulted in the current situation we are in right now yeah do you so see any new viruses coming out any other pandemics that we should probably oh this is only the beginning <laughs> Unfortunately, i'm this scared i'm first. scared to go to 2021 yeah. to find out only find yeah. out that there's another virus going on there actually are other viruses going on not in like humans but in animal even within animals that's a huge actually that's a huge issue also in one health um emerging diseases in animals like transboundary diseases and, and those have huge economic effects for people especially for people for like you know the world trade and all of that yeah so, yeah there's there are he there are other silent pandemics but we're just focusing on the main one right now which is covid um right So, wow, that's crazy. I mean, <laughs> yeah, so, ugh, so much going on right now. It's like you think about it and you're like, okay, we should probably start raising awareness and everything. But I feel like if we don't provide, I want to say education, but at the same time, like, you know, the wet markets and like there is a demand for it, right? And yeah. not just for health, not just for food, but also for religious or mm -hmm. any other, you know, um, beliefs that people have, right? For example, you know, the whole thing with, I think, the ivory or mm -hmm. shark liver oil, for example, like a lot of people buy it not because of like necessarily medicinal or like a uh, benefits, benefits but also for like other beliefs right other spiritual beliefs other things that uh, go uh outside the sphere of science so it's like i feel like the lack of it not I, i don't like to say education because at the same time i don't want to like attack or you know um disrespect other cultures but i feel mm -hmm. like 
it's important to also talk science, right? Because this is like the main thing right now, uh, our lack of knowledge, our lack of um, education in a way, it's like causing all these things, right? Mm -hmm. And yes, media is not helping at all. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yeah, so like in a sense, we are all kind of out of sync and we all have a part to play. So that's why I am so passionate about this idea of One Health and like spreading this message because I think people will start to see how no matter what field you're in, like you can make an impact in some way, Mm -hmm. even if you're just a consumer, like as a consumers, we have so much power, you know, like there's issues, for example, right now with like the palm oil industry and um, how it's destroying, you know, the rainforest in Indonesia. And because of this, the orangutans are critically endangered. And there's also a lot of like smog and smoke going to other places like Singapore because, you know, the wind is carrying yeah. the um, particles of ash and creating respiratory diseases in people. And then the palm oil industry is still, you know, there's still demand for palm oil because it's a very commonly used uh, preservative and it's literally in every product mm-hmm. that you, almost every product that you buy. And so what can we do? Like as consumers, we can try to like educate ourselves and try to buy things that don't have palm oil or uh, things that have um, sustainably sourced palm oil, which exists. So yeah. like things like that, even something as simple as that, you know, like, but again, that's really hard because a lot of these things are more expensive. So then not everybody can afford it. There's a gap there, you know, mm-hmm. um, So yeah, how do we make these things like more accessible to everybody, to to all people? So that's like another, and then that also ties into economics. It ties into all these things. Yeah. (laughs) So let's talk a little about pets. You know, I'm Peruvian, born and raised. You're Colombian, born and raised as well, right? Or you, okay. Uh, Like partly raised in Colombia, partly raised in the U.S. In the U.S., okay. But we come from Latino backgrounds, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like now that, for example, I took a break and left Miami, came to Peru, I'm spending time with my family, and I already spent here, you know, a year and a half, I think. I've been here for a year and a half, which I'm loving, by the way. I love, you know, my family lives in um, the countryside of Peru. So it's like amazing for me. I have, I don't have any complaints as far as, you know, confinement. I, I, you, Cause I can just leave my house and go for a walk with my dogs. You know, it's like go to the woods. But one thing I noticed being here, especially during this um, past year and a half, there is a huge problem that we have with stray dogs and stray cats, you know, and it's not something that I noticed that it's only happening in Peru or in my city, but also in other countries in Latin America, because my stepdad uh, is Colombian. So, Mm. you know, when we went to Colombia, I also noticed that. So there is a problem that we are experiencing. How can we introduce the idea of neutering to our Latinx communities? And how can we raise awareness in a way that is not too invasive, right? But at the same time is educational and, you know, it's, uh, it opens, you know, I guess people's minds to, to the idea of controlling the population of stray dogs and cats, because at least here uh, where I'm at in my city, my community, I mean, people just, it's like, it's being normalized, you know, like you see a lot of stray animals, all these news dogs, you know, getting hit by cars. I mean, there's so much, you know, so many of them and very few people adopt they all want, you know, the pure breed. How could we like introduce this topic to our Latinx communities without, you know, either sounding insulting or too you know, invasive? Yeah, and that's the that's the challenge, right? Um, so at least what I really try to do is give them different perspectives. You know, one of them is because a lot of them, the argument is, oh, like their manhood, like blah blah blah. You know, like oh, that goes against nature or whatever. Mm-hmm. And And I said, you know, most of the dogs that we have, like, they're not, they don't exist here naturally. Like, we created them. Mm -hmm. Like, we created the problem. There's many um, breeds of dogs that actually have so many health issues because we keep inbreeding them. And, um, for example, like, bulldogs and French bulldogs, like, those poor guys, like, they're so cute. They're so cute. But they can barely breathe. And they have, like, 
a myriad of so many diseases and, and not diseases, but like, yeah, like chronic illnesses and things. <laughs> and it's like, I know you love your pet. Like, I know you want what's best for it, but is it really like ethical to uh, allow more animals to suffer in this way? Yeah. I don't think that it is. Um, another point is like public health is another issue, right? Like if you have more stray dogs in an area, I can bet most of those are not vaccinated. Yeah. Right. And so there's a huge risk of us getting diseases from an, an animal. Like if we get bit or if we get scratched, um, rabies is a real concern yeah. and rabies is a fatal disease, you know? Mm -hmm. So how do we help control rabies well one of the biggest things that we can do is first of all vaccinate our pets like we have to vaccinate our pets that's number one but number two we have to try to reduce the number of pets of, of animals in general that mm -hmm. can potentially become at risk and how do we reduce the number of animals well by doing like sterilization campaigns and reducing the number of new uh, individuals being introduced into the population yeah well, that's like another way that I put it. Another thing that I add is like um, the animal's health itself. Mm -hmm. So um, there is higher risk of getting either testicular or mammary cancer in cats and dogs um, the longer you wait to uh, neuter and spay them. A lot of um, female cats or dogs end up getting something that's called pyometra, which is an infection of the uterus and it's life-threatening. You know, yeah. so in order to, and the longer, um, you know, the longer you wait to spay or neuter, like the higher risk for these, these diseases to occur, yeah. either mammary cancer or the pyometra or testicular cancer in the, in the, uh, in the males. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to be, you know, responsible pet owners. Like if you are going to have a pet, you need to be informed of like, what is best for the animal. You need to make sure that they are constantly, you know, vaccinated yearly, that they get their checkups, that make sure they don't have any parasites because it's not only that animal's health, it's also the health of you and your family. Mm -hmm. you know, if, if an animal ends up getting a disease, it could be transmitted to you, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so from that regard, I just try to build awareness about these things. Um, it's really hard though, you know? It is. Is there's still that cultural um, component. <laughs> mm. and at least I try, you know, I have, I have done a, um, so I did a spay and neuter clinic in Honduras mm -hmm. and we worked with a local um, dog rescue. Yeah. There, another thing is cost, you know, people sometimes can't afford it. So a, a good option is, okay, trying to find if there's any, um, spay neuter clinics that are happening, like volunteer spay neutering mm -hmm. clinics, uh, where local veterinarians are going and spaying and neutering sometimes for free or for like a reduced price. So just, yeah. you know, being informed about those things. But anyway, in, in Honduras, I really tried to help, you know, I was the only person there that was Latina from my group and that spoke Spanish fluently. Yeah. So, you know, there were a lot of pet owners there, they, they wanted, they already knew it was important to get them spayed or neutered, but they were also scared. You know, it's like, it's a surgery. Like you're literally cutting them open and at least for the, you're cutting them open and literally going into their abdomen and extracting yeah. the uterus. So it can be scary, you know? So I just tried to, you know, speak to that person in, in their language and uh, connect with them um, to kind of reassure them that, you know, their pet is going to be okay. Like, you know, these are really highly trained professionals. We're here to help you. This is going to make your animal's life so much better, so much healthier. And just, you know, they're going to have a longer life probably because of this. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I just try to explain that in like as best as I can using terminology that they can understand. Because a lot of times I do know that there's, there's just like a general mistrust of uh, medical professionals among the Latinx community and that's not just veterinarians but like human doctors mm -hmm. and it's there's a reason for that you know historically there have been instances where the medical community hasn't really been like they have done research and things that haven't been the most ethical and have harmed some communities of color mm -hmm. you know yeah. so I do understand the apprehension to kind of like trust 
what medical like doctors are telling you and also if we use this very elaborate like fancy language like yes. you just you're gonna lose people so the best thing to do is really just to talk to them like they're your friend you know like a normal person use simple terms um use examples different examples illustrate like different scenarios that what can happen to your pet if you don't like um spay or neuter like that kind of thing yeah, yeah. <laughs> it would be the best approach right because over over here for example what i see there are two things um especially in my own neighborhood right people have pets but they will like open the door to them so that they can go out like out of the house and kind of you know go do their duty like out in the streets and just let them run around right mm -hmm. and if the pet is not neutered well what happens is that you know he could be you know going mating with another stray dog and they keep reproducing and reproduce at least that's what i've seen here in my hometown which mm -hmm. is Cusco, where my family is from or uh lives and you know it's like when you try to talk to the owners sometimes you will get positive responses or you will get like insulted like straight up <laughs> like don you know mind your own business and yeah. it's like how can we i was talking to my mom about this how can we approach people you know it's like i guess like you say you know trying to first become their friends and kind of talk to them without any kind of you know lingo that sounds strange and foreign mm -hmm. to them, you know? like what are you talking about right because there is that distrust like people don't um don't necessarily fall for everything that science says right because in the past like they they you know in the scientific field they have been failures as well and uh people resent that right they they remember the bad things we tend to remember the bad over the good yeah yeah unfortunately um but another thing is um sometimes people come up to me with like weird things that they're told like oh yeah if i neuter my dog he's going to become like bull like at atontado like his personality is going to change and he's going to be like lazy and like oh really <laughs> yeah people tell me that and i'm like how old is your dog like they're like oh they're three i'm like no your dog has already had you know so for example for testosterone mm -hmm. testes like that um it creates the secondary sex characteristics so like in dogs it creates more a bit more like hyper behavior sometimes aggressive behavior um and but it, like if you neuter a dog that's a bit older They've already had their dose of, you know, they've already gone through puberty. Yeah. They've already had their dose of testosterone that has created the characteristics of that dog. Um, and so for the most part, your dog is going to be fine. It's going to be the same dog. It's just it, maybe it might reduce, actually, it might help you reduce some aggression issues in the dog. So that's another good reason to, like, if someone is telling you, oh, like, I don't want to, like, neuter my dog, well, but, but he's very aggressive or he keeps marking you know mm -hmm. everywhere yeah yeah by neutering you can help you know eliminate some of those behaviors as well yeah and also he won't be as like crazy because when dogs are in heat <laughs> they are cra crazy they're gonna be like high energy like trying to get out and escape so you're gonna be lowering the chance of your dog like running away and getting lost or getting hit by a car yeah uh, because now they're not gonna be having that like sexual like drive to try to find someone uh, a female to mate with so that's like another reason so there's like different ways to approach that i mm -hmm. think but, awesome thank yeah. you so much all right <laughs> going back a little bit to your own journey um we talked about representation you know latinx communities how about you know being a female do you consider your field as a still a male-dominated field, or have you seen any changes? So, actually, um, the veterinary field is now predominantly female. Awesome. Um, yeah, like, for example, my class, we're about 80% female. There's only, like, in my class of, like, 120, there's only, like, 15 guys. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> so now so, it's the opposite. It's, yeah, it's the opposite. And that has been, like, a trend since, like, about, I would say, like, since, like, the 80s or so. Um, I don't know why. I think maybe it's, like, you know, women tend to be more, like, nurturing, caring, and so, like, they want to go into a field to, like, you know, help animals. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know what it is. But, um, yeah, it's funny because when you go into my vet school, there's a wall with all the different classes 
of veterinarians. So like each year that they have graduated. So you start out, it, Cornell was founded in like 18, Cornell Vet School, like 18 something, 1896 or something like that. I don't, don't quote me on that. Um, but the very first veterinarian that graduated from Cornell was male, obviously. Mm -hmm. The next few classes, still all male, all male, all male. Then you'll have like, oh, one female, first female. Mm -hmm. And another one, then another one. And then as you keep going and as the years progress, you totally see this change of like all male mm -hmm. and like a few female to like mostly female and like few, ma like few male. <laughs> it's so interesting. And then now another change I've seen in the pictures is like we're starting to see more because obviously most of the females were white, white females. And now you're starting to see a little bit more color diversity. So that's been really nice, but obviously we still have a long, long way to go, especially in when it comes to minorities, because again, like I said, only 5% of veterinarians uh, in the U.S. are Latinx and 2% yeah. are Black. So yeah. it's Have definitely... you ever seen any microaggressions happening around other people of color or students of color or you? Have you ever experienced like any microaggressions for being Latina or uh, mm -hmm. essentially a minority, I guess? Um, I wouldn't say like directly like me, I haven't experienced it, but I have heard of people that have been like, for example, in, in their clinical rotations and a client will come in and like the dog is barking and they're like, oh, sorry, my dog doesn't like black people or like, oh, oh hey. yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> it's like, obviously, it's not the dog <laughs> because dogs don't know what race is. Yeah. It's clearly they're detecting that there's a change in your behavior, like you feel like, hmm, dogs can sense that. They know what their owners are feeling. So the dog is really just projecting what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. So don't tell me that, oh, your dog doesn't like black people. No, you don't like black people. And also like you probably haven't been around many black people. So your dog obviously hasn't seen yeah. that many. But if you show the dog like, oh, hi, this is my friend, like, yeah then the dog is going to be, it's going to be fine. So like, that's, first of all, that is not a thing. <laughs> but yeah, I've heard like colleagues of mine that have said that, like where a client has come in and, you know, been like, oh yeah, sorry. Like, can we have another, another doctor, person? Another yeah. Doctor. Because, you know, I have heard like students in the medical field that, you know, when they're practicing and they're of color, right, they're either Asian or black or mm. uh, Muslim, you know, some patients will ask for other doctors, right? Yeah. Or sometimes they assume that they're like a nurse or like yeah. a, a janitor or something. Oh, and wow. it's like, why are you assuming that? Mm -hmm. um, okay. So even though the veterinary field is now predominantly female, there's still like, in terms of gender, there's still a big gap because in a lot of positions of leadership, like in big veterinary leadership institutions or whatever like even the faculty it's still predominantly male mm. like older white male mm -hmm. um so we still have a long way to go with that <laughs> right um, putting women in a position of power I yeah guess. yes exactly we're definitely seeing more more and more i have so many more like female uh professors that, i mean now i would say it's about 50 50 mm -hmm. but it's still predominantly white mm -hmm. I have still not seen the first Latina professor give me a lecture in my class. I've seen the Latino professor, like male, but not a female. Mm. Is that a, no, that's a lie. I think I saw one, but yeah, out yeah, of like, like there's, yeah, lecture, mm -hmm. you know, um, and even these people are not in positions of power. Like they're not in administration. They're not in like big committees I mean it's starting to change uh, definitely after like the events of the summer there's been like kind of like a reawakening in the veterinary field especially um, and a lot of these like new affinity groups that have popped up like the Latinx Veterinary Medical Association there's also another one called the Black DVM Network there's another institution called Voice um, which is like just general multicultural um, and there's another multicultural veterinary association or something like that. There's another, there's an Asian uh, student, veterinary student association. So a lot of these groups are coming together to kind of like demand more change in the, uh, in the field as a whole. And we're starting to have more of these conversations, even with faculty, they're hosting more like 
oh, let's have like a town hall and like discuss these issues and like discuss racial bias in veterinary medicine and how that affects, you know, um, students of color and also how can we recruit more minority students into the veterinary field there's a lot of barriers too because a lot of these minority students also are lower lower income students so it's harder for them to get veterinary experience for example in the summer because most of these ex vet experiences like shattering or any, or like internships are not paid yeah so if you're someone that's like lower income and you have to help your family put food on the table are but you you'll need to get yeah. that experience. Mm -hmm. but you're not going to go and get that, like, you know, work for free when you have to actually get a real job and, like, help your family. So those there's a lot of barriers, a lot of barriers. Um, also, like, yeah, there's not a lot of, um, sometimes there's not many veterinarians in lower income communities. So, like, how are students supposed to be exp even exposed to the career? if they can't even see someone that looks like them or, or the only people that they see are white. And yeah. so they think, oh, this is like a white profession. Like I don't belong here, but no, so we're really trying like all of these um, organizations are really trying to like uh, to spread more awareness and show more representation. And it's been really great. It's, we've kind of have, we have like a little like revolution <laughs> going yeah, on right now. I love it which is great. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I have three more questions for you. What does a day in the life of a bad student look like? What is your current routine? <laughs> uh, my current routine is team no sleep. I literally, I wake up every morning at around seven. I go into my Zoom lecture for whatever class I have that day, either probably parasitology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I get to look at a lot of parasites and get really grossed <laughs> out. Um, oh my God, there's so many parasites. <laughs> <laughs> see, I don't so think I could do it because I am so, I, I can't see, like I'm very, first of all, I'm a germaphobe. So I'm constantly Holy. thinking of germs. So imagine looking at them all day, like pictures and videos of them. Oh, oh my God. Gabby, so I'm, I'm pretty good when it comes to like, I'm fine with like blood, vomit, feces, like I'm f totally fine. Even like, like abscesses, you know, like pus, that doesn't gross me out. But some of these parasites, oh my <laughs> God, especially the zoonotic ones. I'm like, <laughs> and my professor lo loves to show us videos. And oh my God. people also. Are you ever in like? Do you ever take classes eating or snacking and like? Yeah, I made that mistake. Like um, the first time <laughs> we were talking, I remember we were talking about bot flies, which are these like disgusting uh, flies that lay their larvae inside skin. Oh, I can't even. Oh God! <laughs> I was eating my breakfast, and then I'm like, "That's so." Gross. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. God. And then you see the little, oh God. Yeah. No. I finally found something that does gross me out. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh my God. So, but people were like, oh my gosh, what are you going to do? You're going to be a vet. You have to deal with it. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to tell my vet tech, you go in there, <laughs> I'll tell you what to do. And then I'll like, I'll watch from afar. Yeah. <laughs> we will cross that bridge when I come to it. Because honestly, I mean, with the type of work I want to do, like, developing countries and uh, like different places in the world i am definitely gonna encounter a lot of these uh parasites and i'm oh not excited about that but we'll see hopefully by then i'll become desensitized to it but yes uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. anyway so yeah so i have parasitology and then i have other other courses like i'll have like bacteriology virology um what else immunology We'll have different lab. Everything is online now, which is the, a bummer. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes we do have, so the way Cornell teaches is we do a case-based learning system. So we learn everything in like a lot of things in the context of a case. Yeah. So that is the fun part. I really enjoy that because we get to come in with like a faculty member who's like our tutor. We have like about a group of about eight people, eight students, and we are presented with a case. And so we have to come up with different differentials. Like, so like, what do we think it could be? What, what tests do we want to run? Um, and then we get more information on the case as the week progresses. And so that's been really fun. And we, it's kind of like a puzzle. You know, we yeah. have like 
all these questions that start popping up and you get very curious and then you have to go like research, do your thing, like answer your questions and then you come back together and see what you found. And mm-hmm. I really like that aspect. That's and cool. then, yeah, and then I'm done with school around like three or so. And then I'll, I'll try to take a little break here and there. Uh, and then I have to study for like the rest of the night. So literally like that's my day, all day, every day, even on weekends. <laughs> what do you do for like um relaxation like when you when you're tired and you're like you don't want I, I don't want to think about this anymore like what do you do for fun I guess to co- kind of decompress uh, I like I love watching Netflix or like mm-hmm. just TV just to have something like not not having to use my brain for once just like watching something mm-hmm. um I also like to do Zumba with my sister uh, oh, I love fun. I love dancing I really the thing I miss most because of this pandemic is going out to dance like I love going dancing salsa reggaeton like all of that I miss that so much oh my god um but yeah I try to still like do Zumba or like go for a walk with my dog Mm -hmm. Uh, what else oh at night I like to read like (laughs) comic like um graphic novels oh that's cool (laughs) not comic books graphic novels on my phone (laughs) before Mm -hmm. bed yeah Uh, yeah just or i sometimes i listen to podcasts i'm a nerd i love listening to like wildlife uh conservation podcasts or sometimes like political stuff yeah that's cool i mean uh definitely wildlife sounds interesting i don't like normally i follow podcasts that are more like on the productivity side and business side but like i've been trying to look for other podcasts to listen to that are kind of outside my normal interests Uh, politics I don't know about you know especially at nighttime I'd be like you know like what I know know, when you hear about politics it kind of makes you angry for at at least for me yeah I try I try to stay away from it but I I can't because a lot of these issues that come up are things that I'm very passionate about or things that I care about and so they kind of remind me like oh my gosh there's still work to do there's something I have to do Mm -hmm. it keeps that passion but on the downside it, it does stress me out a lot and it, I don't need more stress in my life, mm-hmm. so I yeah. try my best, but it's hard, especially in the world that we live in right now. It's yeah, it can be that's wild. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, or I try to watch like cute animal videos. Oh yeah, I like that, like kitty videos or like. Yeah, I love so watching cool. like uh, looking at elephant videos. You know, like oh, those baby elephants yeah. that are playing in the water and everything. Like fifty yeah. percent of the accounts I follow on Instagram are animal related. <laughs> <laughs> my boyfriend actually says that I should have been a bad because I'm like so obsessed oh. like with all kinds of animals and he's like why are you doing like you know while I was in college like, why are you doing finance you should have gone into bed school and I was like yes <laughs> probably you know I started finance because I thought I liked it and I still do I just like realized recently that it's not my call in a way and I mean that's okay I mean I still like it and I still can use it for my own personal use like for example you know my, uh, learning about par- uh, personal finances and stuff like that but you know to kind of work in the field like go back to corporate America it's like oh, I don't think so what about like the nonprofit world and stuff? I thought about it I thought about it but you know like during this pandemic, I kind of started exploring my artistic side or my habit, you know, my, my hobbies, I should say. And uh, podcasting is one of them. So I was like, you know what, I might just like start exploring this. You never know where it could take you, you know? Yes, I'm excited. Yeah. Awesome. Me too. <laughs> All right. What's next for you? When can we finally call you a doctor? Ooh, uh, hopefully, hopefully, um, 2023. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not that far, actually. Not that- it's three years from now I will be a doctor hopefully and an MPH Um, but what's next Um, after vet school I have a couple of options but Mm -hmm. right now I'm leaning towards doing what's called it's called like an internship Mm -hmm. so it's it's a job you get paid not much but you get like extra training like one-on-one training with veterinarians in a specific um, field of veterinary medicine Mm -hmm. I've been thinking about if I go that route I'd probably like to do something in ambulatory medicine which is essentially like large animals so like you go on the truck and you drive around different farms and you look at a variety of animals it's not just horses it's like everything like cows alpacas chickens cats like Mm -hmm. whatever they have in their farm and they need 
you to look at, you look at, and you have only what's on your truck. And it's very like, kind of like field, um, field work in a way. Uh, it's not super like, uh, what's it called? <laughs> fancy. <laughs> yeah, it's not super fancy. It's not like everything is sterile. Like it's not sterile at all, but you have to like, kind of just work with what you have. And the reason I want to do that is because again, I want to work in developing countries and mm -hmm. in those areas, I'm not going to have access to a lot of things. I'm going to have to be like, you know, thinking like being creative and like using what I have. Yeah. Using your resources. Yeah. And so I think that that will really train me and help me with that. And it'll be more, it kind of would replicate more the um, scene, the scenario, the mm -hmm. environment that I would have in like, uh, like in a developing country and uh, working with farmers is important. And, but again, I still want to work with wildlife. And then after that, I've been thinking about the Peace Corps a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's <laughs> um, a good option. Yeah, I've been thinking about it. Um, they have this thing called uh, Peace Corps Response, which is like shorter assignments. It's not like the two years. It's three and 10 months. So it's a lot more like doable for me. Um, and it's for professionals who already have like specific degrees, specific um I guess, expertise and to do very specific projects for like a community. So I like to do something like that. And then after that, maybe, maybe the PhD, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> I <laughs> think of, you can do it. It's yeah. just like, don't, don't put too much pressure, you know, like, I if know. You, like you want to take a break, just do it, you know, because <laughs> if you push yourself yeah. too hard, you can either become discouraged or you, you know, just do it, but not yeah. like with all your, you know, all you have to give. So. And this other idea I have is like, I would love to have like a TV show. Oh, about that's cool. One Health. I actually, I, I meant to say this and I'm sorry, I didn't mention it before. Um, I've been enjoying it because I was, you know, kind of um, doing my research for this interview and I was enjoying your, the content that you share. And it's definitely very informative and like <clears throat> anybody can understand it. You know, I'm not in the medical field or anything like that, but I was like, okay, like there's so much to learn. Like I was actually, <laughs> I was actually pretty interested. So that, that could be yeah i'd love that and i'm i'm i have plans to continue that show i'm actually planning right now i'm trying to see if i can convert it to a podcast form too actually um i just again my my i have a very very busy schedule so it's not like i have like a ton of free time but i do still feel very passionate about this project and i like more people to know about one health and so i definitely am, am have plans to bring back the show but even aside from that, I'd, lo I'd love to have like a show on like Animal Planet or like National Geographic <laughs> and have, um, yeah, just have it be about One Health and conservation and like traveling the world, doing different projects and like working with people and, and also have some like freaking Latino representation on TV. Oh my like, gosh, yes. Latino woman. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I'll be cheering. I was like, woo. Hey. Yeah, because have you heard of um, Dr. Evan Anting? No. So oh, you look him up. He, he's he's fantastic. He has his own show on Animal Planet, and it's called Evan Goes Wild. And so he travels to all these different countries, and he goes around and like talks to, uh, and he talks about conservation, and he also does stuff with like veterinary medicine, and he'll mm -hmm. help out different vets like in that country. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to have something like that, but. I want it to be geared towards like a bilingual audience, like Latino community and also like an American audience and also just be like, you know, show that there are women, Latina women in conservation because representation, like I said, is a huge issue. And I want to like help inspire more, more people to join this profession and also like fall in love with conservation and One Health. Yeah. So. Awesome. we'll see <laughs> i love it no i i wish you the best i can't wait to see what you do next yeah i'd love that <laughs> yeah all right one last question what would you tell a girl who wants to pursue your career what are the first steps she can take first steps visualize what you want to do where you want to be when you're an adult and keep that image in your mind constantly and remind yourself of your goals and that that's what you want and don't let anybody tell you that you can't do that mm -hmm. if that's what you want in your heart 
keep fighting for it, keep pushing, keep defying odds, keep proving people wrong. Doesn't matter what they tell you, like just keep pushing, keep working hard. You have to work really hard. Um, try to get as much experience as possible. Knock on a, as many doors as you can. Uh, my mom always says, la cara del santo hace el milagro, mm -hmm. <laughs> which means like um, the face of the saint makes the miracle, which doesn't make much sense in English. In but English. basically it's just like you like show up and you show your face and you demonstrate your interest and your passion to people. People will be willing to help you and to guide you along the way. You will find mentors that are going to be rooting for you. Mm -hmm. So, but you have to not be afraid to knock on doors. You might get many, many no's and doors shut in your face, which has happened, but you really only need that one yes. And once you have that, then you can go on to the next thing and the next thing. But the important thing is to always keep that goal clear in your mind and stay sharp, like razor sharp focus on that, you know? Yeah. Um, it might evolve along the way and that's okay. Um, but yeah, just keep pushing and keep trying and don't give up. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much, Maria. Thank you so much. I, I enjoyed our conversation and definitely I wish you the best. You know, I can't wait to see the things that you're going to achieve. So thank you. Hi, thank you, Gabi. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode. You liked what you heard? Tell me what you liked in the review section. And if you want more episodes like this, please share your suggestions. After this episode, the conversation continues in our new Facebook group. The question of the day is, what steps can millennials and Gen Z take to become more involved in animal conservation? Let me know by joining us at the Invernadero Mind Facebook group and share your thoughts. I can't wait to see you there.